All right, all the glory to the name of the Lord this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on your time all over the world. Welcome all the same to church. Please bring your faith, bring your expectations over to this technology so we can have a good time together in the presence of the Lord because every joint is going to supply. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome. This is Church at Hero Smart. And Hero Smart is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations in keeping with the instruction of Yahushua. In Matthew ch chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to. And Lord, I will be with you till the end of the age. And in trying to keep this instruction in this ministry, God's given us the great privilege to create a resource through which we can do that very well. And that resource we've titled the Online Discipleship Program, or the ODP in short. Now, the ODP is a set of studies from the Word of God, which means section into five major categories of studies. The pharmacy section of the Word, the milk section of the Word, the meat section of the word, the water section of the word, and combination meals. And in trying to come through the 2022 ODP, God's helping us to come through the pharmacy aspect of it, uh, which I believe by the grace of God, God's going to help us to wrap up today in uh, the pharmacy section of the word. The pharmacy section of the word are going to be certain teachings that we've seen in the Bible uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, through which we can return our hearts to the status of the original design. We're talking about our hearts being returned to the status of the original design right now. We're talking about having the innocence of a child once again. Before we, be, uh, we became like uh, uh, Luciferous adults. We're talking about having the innocence of a child. We're talking about returning our thought processes our attitudes, our way of thinking, back to childlike attitudes. And Jesus says somewhere, it says, except you turn around and you become like little children, you're not going to have a place in the kingdom of heaven. That's going to be true. That's going to be true. We were all born into this planet with certain critical attitudes that we've discovered, especially from the parable of the sower, as honesty, humility, and faith. And all children have that attitude, have those attitudes. If the child is still in his innocence, that innocence stage of their lives, uh, they haven't got to what we call the, the age of accountability where they start rebelling against the voice of God and their consciences. If they are still over there, they are going to have that attitude, that attitude of innocence and attitude of honesty, humility, and faith. And we were all like that. But unfortunately, ever since the age of accountability and being tutored by Lucifer's adults, <laughs> Lucifer's emotion, we started getting depleted of those, those, those qualities in our hearts. We started exercising ourselves in negative attitudes of dishonesty, pride and arrogance, lack of faith toward God and fear because of what the devil is talking about, and all this kind of evil attitudes, evil attitude of unbelief. I think the Bible calls it, it was somewhere. We start training ourselves to be like that ever since the age of accountability. And then we stumble on certain principles that God is born again. And all of a sudden, right now, we need to be untrained because your soul didn't get born again. Your mind didn't get born again. Your attitudes didn't get born again. So you got to relearn those childlike attitudes again on purpose. And that is the reason for the pharmacy section of the word. We're going to see later when we get to the spiritual groceries section of the ODP by the grace of God, how you can on purpose teach yourself to identify certain stimuli of your spiritual systems to determine whether you need to be exposed to pharmacy all over again, whether you need to be exposed to the milk section of the word all over again, the meat of the word, the water of the word. Well, that's going to build that spiritual intelligence into us. But first things first. God, straighten up your attitude so you can have a clean slate for the rest of the year. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So that's what God's been helping us to do for the past four weeks. And this is going to be part five. We are going to be talking about the Overcomer's Secret, part five. And the Overcomer's Secret is a critical resource that God helped us to write in the ministry uh, that we have been using all through the years 
by the grace of God to return our hearts back to the status of the original design. This is the book right in here. It's a 440 something page book and it contains critical, critical nuggets that God helped us to discover all through the pages of the Bible uh, through which we can return our hearts back to honesty, humility, and faith in increasing measures by the grace of God. So we come through uh, parts one, two, three, and four of the Overcomer Secret, and today is going to be this, the final section of it, which is uh, section five. It's going to be titled, What's Next? Hallelujah. What is next? How does the Overcomer's Secret tie into all this things about the lifestyle of Jesus and how does it map to my destiny? We're going to be talking about all of those in section 5, the Overcomer's Secret Part 5 today with what is next. So section 5 is titled what is next and, and he has a couple of chapters to it. Chapter 25 is going to be titled Carry On Just Like You Started. Chapter 26 is titled The Levels of Honesty. Chapter 27 is titled Levels of Humility. Chapter 28 is titled Levels of Faith. And there are a couple of appendices right after that. Appendix A, Quick Help. Appendix B, Quick uh, Quiz Time Answers. Appendix C, Index. And Appendix D, Glossary of Terms. You're going to see all these things over there to give us really, really critical strategies to return our hearts back to the status of the original design. So chapter number 25 is going to be on page number 263. If you have your copy on the Overcomer Secret, you're welcome to grab it, turn to it, and let us study together to US 5, by the grace of God. Carry on just like you started. Hallelujah. So when we're talking about carry on just like you started, what are we really talking about? We're talking about carrying on with certain things that got you born again. Hallelujah. And where did we get that from? Well, we got that from Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 6. So please turn over there if you got your Bible. Uh, or, or if not, you're welcome just to move on page number 264 of the Overcomer Secret. It's going to be there for you. Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 6. It says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. Rooted. Underline that. Well, that means that those same principles are going to get you rooted. It means, in other words, they're going to get you your foundation. Built up. It means that you're getting built up. They're going to be there. Those same principles are going to be there. Strengthen in the faith. So to get strengthened, you cannot afford to ignore those principles that got you born again as you were taught and overflowing with thanks, thankfulness. So this verse of scripture lets us know that certain, certain principles got us born again. It says, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. So I'm going to ask you this question. How many people have received Yahushua, Christ Jesus, as the Lord of their lives? Right? Everybody on the call by the grace of God, of course, I know. You call Yahushua Lord or Jesus Lord. Whatever name is convenient for your culture, our God is really gracious. He is uh, permissive of that. You call Him Lord. The Messiah will die and was resurrected from the dead. But I'm going to ask you this question. How did you call him Lord? What made you, what positioned you to call Yahushua Lord 20 years ago, 5 years ago, 4 years ago? And some other sibling of yours couldn't call Jesus Lord. What's that quality in you that makes you special? If you can identify those things that position you to call Yahushua Lord, now, those things are going to be really, really important to keep you rooted, to keep you grounded, built up, and strengthened in the faith. Oh, but what are those things that I, what, what kind of qualities did I have to position me to call Jesus Lord? Well, unfortunately, the body of Christ hasn't really emphasized the teaching aspect of discipleship. So we really do not know what we stumbled on to make Yahushua the Lord of our lives. We just stumble on certain principles and all of a sudden, well, yeah. 
But if you don't know what you stumbled on, most likely you cannot consolidate on that strategy. And certainly not, you will not be able to grow in those attitudes that got you started. Because <laughs> nothing happens by chance. And if you can't grow those attitudes that got you started, then it becomes really easy for the devil to snatch it away from you. It becomes really easy for the devil to snatch it away, to snatch it away. Wow. So that's the reason studying this kind of concept is going to be really important for you. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. It says, so as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. So what are those things that position me to receive Christ Jesus as Lord? I'm going to ask you to turn to Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 right now. Identify a certain favor, a certain favor that got me born again. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. And the word salvation over there is talking about being born again. Because if you read that verse in context from verse 1 of Titus chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5, you're going to be he's going to be talking about the rebirth of our spirits. So He changed our spirits. In other words, John 3, 3, John 3, 16 experience he saved us because of his mercy. So that was a critical favor of the Lord that I attracted to get me born again called the mercy of God. All right? So mercy got me started. And guess what? Mercy is going to carry me on. Mercy is going to get me built on. Mercy is going to get me strengthened. Mercy is going to get me to carry on. In my Christian journey, following after Yahushua. So there is no forgetting mercies anymore. I'm not going to get to a stage in my walk with the Lord. I say, well, thank God for the mercies of yes yesterday and, you know, past years. But you know what, Lord? I don't think I need your mercy anymore. No, no, no. You are going to atrophy so fast. The devil's going to beat you black and blue. No, you can't say that. Mercy started you. Mercy is going to carry you on. So make sure you bookmark that. Titus chapter 3 and Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 is really important. Make sure you bookmark that. Mercy got me started. Mercy is going to carry me on. And now the scripture in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 identifies for us another favor of God that got us started. Now this time is going to be Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Let's read it slowly together. This is for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, oh, okay, on the line there. If you have a copy of the Overcomer Secret, you're going to see certain words that are boldened over there. Let's try to fixate on those words right now. By grace you have been saved through faith. So this verse of scripture identifies additional favors. An additional favor that got me started, that's going to be grace through the operation of faith. And if you combine the scripture together with Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, so it means that I've got to carry on with grace as well. How? Two critical favors that God has born again. Mercy, that's in Titus 3, 5. Grace in Ephesians 2, 8. Can you all see that? Mercy and grace. So mercy and grace got me started. Then guess what? Mercy and grace will keep me going. And of course that's going to make sense because all through last week and two weeks ago we talked about the elements of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus to defeat the law of sin and death. And in our study and analysis we came up with two elements of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus Mercy and grace. So is it going to be out of reason for the Holy Spirit to orchestrate Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, Titus chapter 3 verse 5, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to reiterate the importance of carrying on with mercy and grace? No, it's not going to be out of reason. The Holy Spirit can do that on purpose and that's what he did through his letters. So with a combination of Colossians 2.6, Titus 3.5, 
Ephesians 2 8, you are going to see that I need to carry on with grace favor, mercy favors. I got to be growing in these favors just like I got born again. I cannot do anything without the grace and mercy of God. Lock that into your mind. But we're not even going to stop at grace and mercy. We're going to take a little deeper. What are certain attitudes that kept me open to the grace of God and to the mercy of God? We studied those attitudes all through last week and two weeks ago, and I believe even three weeks ago, <laughs> by the grace of God. To understand that what kept us open to the grace of God will be honesty, humility, and faith. What scripture says that? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 in verse 5. 1 Peter 5, 5 right now. Let's take a look at it. How did we get grace? And some of the party over there didn't, didn't get grace. Let's look at it. It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the way I stayed open to the grace of God, get born again to start with, was because I was humble. And that's correct. You look that illogically when the preacher came up and said, well, if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, come over to the altar right now and I'm going to pray for you. You're going to get born again. Chained on the inside, on your way to heaven. Well, because you were humble, you said, well, that makes sense. I don't have anything to lose. They were asking me to come and do something super egregious. All they wanted to do is just to come make Jesus the Lord of my life. Come on, that makes hey, preacher, please come pray for me. Lay your hands on me. And you went on to the altar. That's humility. That's exactly what a normal child is going to do. That's the attitude of a child. You must have had that attitude when you got born again. They got to make you keep that attitude. Stay that humble. Stay in that mode of humility and faith in God. Which actually should have been preceded by honesty because you looked at your life and see how rotten you were. You were as a sinner. I said, I look at my life right now. Well, I say, I need help on the side of eternity. Satan and the devil and all these challenges, they're defeating me. Lost the flesh, lost the heart, proud of life. They're getting me defeated. I need somebody to help me. And then here comes the preacher. Say, well, come, make Jesus Lord of your life. It's going to set you free from your sins. Say, well, that's right. I believe that. And the voice of your conscience is. Trying to tell you, well, you better respond quickly. You're going to go to hell. So yes, sir. I responded quickly to it. I said, yeah, I'm not going to go to hell. God, come and pray for me. You respond that in honesty, in humility, and in faith to get born again. If you're born again, you call Jesus the Lord of your life. That is predominantly your experience. Amen. And I've been through a crusade. Maybe you were watching a TV show and something came up or somebody read a scripture to you. Whatever physical circumstance God orchestrated, your story is going to be the same. You responded in honesty, in humility, and in faith. And that kept you open to the grace of God and to the mercy of God. We looked at the story of the Canaanite woman as well last week or two weeks ago. Talking about Matthew chapter 15 and how she got mercy. She got mercy because she had honesty, humility, and faith. Now, if we are going to carry on with mercy and grace to be built up, to be strengthened, well, guess what? We are going to carry on with honesty, with humility, and with faith. Important. But if we do not understand that, well, honesty, humility, and faith is my pedestal, is what's going to carry me on all through this process, how can I, on purpose, grow my honesty quotient? I can't. Because I didn't know how important it is. If I don't know that humility is really important, it's literally the oxygen of my spiritual systems. How can I, on purpose, on purpose, design my way of thinking, my attitudes, to be more and more humble? How can I say, no, 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 land, you're going to humble yourself in this situation. You're going to practice your money over here. I'm not going to do that. And unfortunately, the con land, the unbeliever, they're over there on the outside, <laughs> making you arrogant and dishonest and trying to push you against your father with everything they talk about. When they breathe, they are arrogance personified. And here you come to church, 
And the only thing you hear in church will be insincere teachings of the Word of God, incomplete and incomplete gospel. That's what you hear. You're not going to be humble. You're going to lose that humility. Oh, but I'm born again. No, no, no. But you're not born again anymore. Because you back still in the two years ago. <laughs> no, but I still call Jesus Lord. Really? You still call Jesus Lord. Really? You think you think call Jesus Lord. But you have a treason in your heart. Oh, but I say Jesus, my Lord. But that's not what you said with your conscience. Are you still born again? No, you're not. Oh, but I pray in tongues. Well, you harbor truth in your heart. You and your soul called tongues. If you don't change in that state, God can put you in hell. But get serious. Yahushua said, it's not those who mouth, Lord, Lord, that will make it over to the kingdom of hell. But those who live to please my Father, letting you know that calling Yahushua Lord goes beyond just a mouth experience. You got to believe in it now. There's no truth in my heart. Now, the way that's going to work for you is if you stay honest and humble. What are you talking about? Watch this chart, and I'm going to show you. How many people can see this beautiful map on the board right now? I'm calling the map to destiny. Just to get you really quickly to see how important honesty, humility, and faith is to you becoming eligible for the next rapture. For immortality after to start with, and then the next rapture. So you guys are just talking about honesty, humility, and faith. I want something deep, man. I want to see uh, when is Jesus going to come. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing deep in when Jesus, if you don't fix this part. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus all through the while that we've been studying it. You see over here, right here, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has two elements. The elements will be mercy, number one, and grace, number two. Can you see that? The Lord Saul is going to is going to is going to create two elements for there two two main sections or two main favors of God that God dispenses to our humanity to defeat the law of sin and death. It's called mercy and grace. Now mercy and grace will work because HHF is there for you. Honesty, humility, and faith, and they need to be growing in leaps and bounds to give you more mercies and more grace. Now the more mercies you get and the more grace you get the stronger and the wiser you are going to be and you are going to have favorable circumstances. Things are going to be working for you. God's not going to be resisting you because God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. You're going to have favor in your circumstances. You are, you're going to have the wisdom of the righteous. Strength is going to be there for you. He who falters in a time of adversity, how small is their strength? Mercy is going to put in circumstances of favor around you Grace is going to give you strength and wisdom on the inside. Now, the stronger you are, the more you are able to sustain the status of obedience. The more obedient you are going to be over here. You're going to have zero treason in this mode. Zero treason. The way to have zero treason is to have an abundance of strength and wisdom and favorable circumstances which come from the mercy and the grace of God. You're going to have zero treason in this mode over here. Now, when you have zero treason, God's not going to be unfaithful. Every action of obedience is going to be rewarded with a crown of life. The Word of God says, uh, those who through consistency in doing righteousness, He is going to give the life to move their bodies in the direction of glory, honor, and immortality. We call that the anointing upon. Now, the more anointing upon you have is going to move you in a direction of immortality because it's going to start sowing the seed of the next resurrection in your physical body. We call that immortality. And during the stage of the next resurrection of the dead, which we believe is going to be approximately 40 days before the next rapture out of here, you are going to be eligible for that next immortality and then take your turn on the trip out to this planet in the next rapture. Now, how many people want to go to the next rapture? Raise your hands if you're listening to me. Or you want to be here with the Antichrist going to be ringing your nose. No, that's not your story. You want to be here in the next rapture. But I'm telling you, the way to go with the next rapture is to stay with increasing honesty, humility, and faith. Can you see how this maps together right now? Right here. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has two elements to it, mercy and grace. Mercy and grace will work in my life because HHF is increasing. Honesty, humility, and faith. What will that translate to? 
favorable circumstances, strength on the inside, wisdom. What's that going to translate to? Zero treason in my life. Sustain perfect obedience. What's that going to translate to? More anointments, more anointment upon me. The crown of life is going to be growing on me. I'm going to keep my crown. What's that crown going to do? Move me in the direction of immortality. The glorified resurrection experience, which is the hope of salvation. And when I keep on sowing that seed of the anointing upon the crown of life in my physical body, during that season, I will be eligible for the next glorification of the physical body and subsequently the next rapture out of here. So is grace and mercy, honesty and humility, the law of the spirit of life of Christ Jesus, the overcomer's secret. Is it important? Absolutely yes. That is the map to destiny. This is the basis of it. This is where it starts. That's the reason we start every ODP session with the pharmacy section of the word, which we know is the overcomer secret by the grace of God. Did you get something from it? Hallelujah. All right, you're welcome to take a snapshot of this right now. It's going to be on the board for you. You can download it from the website, but please and please make sure you lock this into your mind. This is the curriculum. This is the reason we're doing all of this. First, the over here. You got, you got to make sure you're growing in grace and mercy, right? You got con somebody. Hallelujah. Still more. And that graphic is going to be really important and is available as well from the study notes. So there's another resource that we just published called Discipleship Study Notes for Rapture Ready Believers. Okay? Reason I'm doing all of this because I'm going with all of you. <laughs> I'm not gonna let anybody stay. No, 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 no. You're coming on board. I'm gonna be fighting after drumming into your ears. You're coming on board. Now, the side push up study notes for the rapture ready. You're gonna see on page number 21, you are gonna see that over there. This is the map to destiny, and that's the reason you're gonna see the law of the spirit of life and corruption is the basis for it. Glory to God. Really important. So we've got to grow our levels of honesty. We've got to grow in humility so that uh, we can grow in faith as well, of course, so that we can grow our mercy quotient and grow our uh, grace quotient by the grace of God. So chapter 26 now starts talking about how to grow in honesty. What are the different levels of honesty over there that we can grow? Some practical strategies that God allowed us to see in chapter 27, we all receive different levels of humility. And then chapter 28, different levels of faith and how to on purpose cultivate my attitudes and honesty. Doing certain things that would train my way of thinking to be honest, to be more humble, to be in faith toward God. So in honesty, we talked about all through TOS 1, TOS 3, three critical levels of honesty that uh, will position the believer... Firstly, as baseline levels of honesty, which we can find from the parable of the sower, we call it H01, H02, H03. H01 is going to be acknowledging the existence of God. That is honesty because you can see the existence of God all around you. The order of your physical body did not just come to play because of some kind of big bang evolutionary experience. You know better than that. And if you debate around that, you are dishonest. H.O. 1 is going to be acknowledging there's a God who created the physical body. Anybody who says there is no God who came out of a big bad experience is patently dishonest. H.O. 2 is going to be acknowledging the folly of one's ways and attributing that as the source of misery. I've got to train my way of thinking. If something is breaking my circumstances, it's because there is foolishness in the way I, I behave. There is some kind of folly in my way. I'm going to acknowledge that. Now that we point an accusing finger at God, point an accusing finger at somebody else and say, well, it's because of, no, 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 I'm, I'm foolish in some kind of way. You've got to acknowledge that. The word of God says that the folly of a man's ways will ruin their ways. And if they acknowledge that, their heart's not going to rage against the Lord. That's H-O-2. H-O-3 is acknowledging God as the source of my prosperity. There's nothing good in anybody. Yahushua was sad, only God. Is good. You gotta acknowledge that. Well, that's honesty as well. But then there are going to be additional levels of honesty, especially in our relationships, that God allowed us to see, 
which will leverage the platform of these three levels of harness that we talked about. And I'm saying that because of uh, the scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 15 and verse 25. Now you got your Bible, go ahead and please turn over there to Ephesians chapter 4 right now. And um, you know, we're going to pick these two verses for the sake of time. You're going to take verse 15 and then verse 25 and understand holistically how there will be additional levels of honesty, honesty which will leverage the platform of those baseline levels of honesty that I just talked about. Ephesians chapter 4, turn to it. Hallelujah. The word of God says in verse 15 and 25, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Now look at it. Speaking the truth in love to your neighbor. So in my relationships, I've got to practice honesty as well. But I can only do that if I am in love. So that it's just got the baseline, baseline level of love, which honesty and your one, two, three is your position me. To be operating the God kind of love toward God and toward myself, toward the people in my world, which is going to position me right now to be honest in my relationships with my neighbors. Can you see that? If there is no love in my heart, I'm not going to be honest to my neighbor. If there is no God kind of love in my heart, there is no way I can grow in my level of honesty. And guess what? My mercy quotient is not going to grow because of that. So HO1, HO2, HO3, get me found and grounded in the God kind of love toward God, toward myself, toward the people in my world, correct? Now with that platform of love, I can grow in honesty, and I can grow in mercy, and I can grow in grace. That's why it's important. So who is my neighbor then? Yahushua identifies Talking in one of the parables, somebody came to him and said, who's my neighbor? And he talked about <laughs> the parable of the great Samaritan, the good Samaritan. Yahushua says, anybody in your world is going to be your neighbor. They don't have to necessarily, necessarily be your next door neighbor, but if God makes their path cut across your path, they are your neighbor. And you are going to see that there are three major categories of relationships that we can have in our lives. How do you know that? Look at your physical body. There are three relationships between the members of your physical body. There is a relationship between your head and your hand, for example. Your head is the center of command. It issues commands. So go ahead and you pick up this book. Well, the instruction came from my head. And did you see that my hand just comply and pick, pick the book up. So there's a relationship between my head and my hand. And number two, there's a relationship between my hand and my head. A second relationship. And then number three, there's a relationship between this hand and this hand. <laughs> three relationships. And look at your relationships over there. The relationship between your head, your hand is going to be like the truly greater, which is going to be called the truly greater. There's a relationship between the truly greater and your hand is going to be the true lesser. So true the greater, true the lesser, and then the other hand is going to be your peer. So there are truly greater relationships, there are truly lesser relationships, and there are peers' relationships. Now the word of God says in Ephesians 4 that we just read over here that you've got to make sure you practice honesty in all those relationships. Whoa. Correct. Oh, that's going to be easy. The way I'm going to practice honesty is just coming to tell them, hey, I took a bag of potatoes from the pantry, actually. Well, honesty goes beyond that. Why? Because he has to be in love. What do you mean by that? I said, I am going to communicate to the truly greater because I love the truly greater. Hmm. How am I going to do that? You are going to communicate to your peers in honesty because I love to pooch my peers in a direction of the God kind of character. So with an objective of love right now, which you all know coming through the ODP, is not just kind of some, some kind of random 
attitude of honesty that I'm going to tell them, well, you know what, there's a chicken in the pantry and all. No, 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 no. It's deeper than that. It's because of love. Speaking the truth, be honest because of love. Because I love you, I'm going to practice honesty toward you. I'm going to practice honesty toward the true lesson in my world because I want to love the true lesson. Oh, well, glory to God. It takes it, it takes it to another level when you start thinking like that. That's the reason you got to be grounded to God kind of love. This is the way I am. When we're talking about love, you're talking about God. I want to love the true and greater because of God. Why? Because God is love, and the scripture tells me to love like God loves. So how do I speak the truth to the truly greater? Well, the way I'm going to speak the truth to the truly greater is to communicate to the truly greater that I need the unction or the resource on their lives to fulfill my destiny. And well, how did you, how did you know that? Well, I'm going to tell you how to deduce that when we get to chapter 27. And we start talking about humility toward the truly greater. And then you know that humility toward the truly greater is going to come after honesty to other truly greater. That's you're going to know that. In your relationships with truly greater, the way you're going to tell the truth in love to the truly greater, if you are going to push the truly greater in the direction of the God kind of character, in the direction of their destiny, you are going to communicate to them through your words, through your gestures, through your thoughts, through your actions, that I need something on you to fulfill my destiny. If I do not communicate that to the true greater, I hate the true greater. Categorical. That's what's going to happen. Because what's going to happen is that the auction on their inside will start dying because you're communicating something else to them. Case in point, Yahushua goes to his own town. God had placed certain anointings on him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the goodness of the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to do all kinds of miracles for the people in Israel. And by extension, the people in my own town as well. You guys are going to benefit from this thing. You guys listen to me. I'm here right now to help you. I'm here to help you guys. But guess what? All the people in this whole town are thinking about it. And they know on the back of their hearts, they've seen the miracle is done before. Wow, this guy speaks with so much authority, with so much power. We haven't seen anybody like this before. Oh, wow. But come on. He knows something more than me. But he made the last piece of furniture in my house. He played soccer with my kids when I was growing up. And he's the son of a carpenter. Come on. Come on. I'm not going to listen to him. And they started communicating to Yahushua. They know we don't believe you're the true greater, even though God's not in the back of their hearts. He is the true greater. Now, what's the impact of that communication on Yahushua's ministry? Think about it deeply right now. Slow down, guys. Let's, let's think a little bit. So we're laying out a case point, a case in point right now, in which the people in Yahushua's own town were dishonest at age 04 level to Yahushua. Now, what's the impact of that dishonesty to Jesus' ministry? The word of God says he could not do any mighty miracles in there. Why? Because of their unbelief. And you know, unbelief is going to have the pedestal of lack of humility, right? Because humility is going to give you understanding to make you believe and have faith. But then the, 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 the pedestal of humility is actually honesty. So Jesus could not do any mighty miracles because of their dishonesty, their pride and arrogance, their lack of understanding, and their, their lack of faith. He could not. The word used over there, go check it out again in Mark chapter 6, is he could not. That means he was stripped of the ability to literally heal somebody. Imagine that. And yet, he had the spirit without measure. Now, if he stayed in that mode of you know, people resisting and kicking against him, saying, no, you're not a truly great, what do you think you are? You made the last piece of furniture in my home, and I'm not going to listen to you. Will Yahushua fulfill his destiny? Think about that. No, he wouldn't. Even though he was the truly greater, he is going to be reduced to the status of the truly lesser, and of course, to the shame and the detriment of everybody in his realm. If Yahushua had failed at executing 
children successfully the plan of the Father to establish everlasting righteousness, he not only will lose, we all lose together. So is that love to the truly greater when the truly lesser does not speak the truth in love to the truly true greater? How do you speak the truth in love? Let them know that I know you have something on you that I need. And I'm going to pull that something on you for me. Let them know that. In your thought processes, with your word, with your gestures, with your actions over there, do not lie to the truly greater. And you will love the truly greater. And guess what? For your benefit. Mercy will increase in your account because of that attitude. Is that attitude honesty correct? It is honest. How does it work in practical terms? Look at what happens in your home. Here's a child growing up in your house, and you're trying to teach the child ABCs. I'm teaching my child ABCs out of count, one, two, three over there. But anytime I try to teach the child, this is two plus two is going to be equivalent to four. The child says, no, I don't believe that. What do you mean two plus two is going to be equal to four? No, two plus two is going to be equal to whatever I want to call it. Come on, sit down. I know I'm wrong you. No, what are you talking about? Two plus two is going to be equal. Will there be peace? Will there be a way to further resources and channel resources to develop that? No, there's not. Things are going to break down like that. That's the reason honesty in relationships is important. H.O. 4. Oh, but how did you get that? How do you know a truly greater, a truly less? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. But that's how to speak the truth to the truly greater. Let's speak in the truth to, the, to our peers. That's going to be honesty level 5. Remember, there are three different relationships right now. Truly greater, truly, um, truly lesser, and your peers. But I'm going to call level 5 your peers. How do you speak the truth to your peers? You speak the truth to your peers by creating an impression in the minds of your peers that you are genuinely interested in their concerns. I do not see my peers as the truly greater. In other words, I'm not necessarily communicating to them that I need something on them to fulfill my destiny. That's the technical difference. But I want them to know that I'm not going to be selfish. And in that mode of talking to your peers like that, you love your peers. In that mode, you are going to push your peers in the direction of their destiny, and you will increase your mercy quotient because of that. That's how to be honest to your peers. How do you know that? Wait until chapter 27, I'm going to tell you. Honest to level 6, H.O. 6, is going to be equivalent to creating an impression in the minds of the truly lesser that you have been through and or vulnerable to what they are going through at the moment. You got to tell your subordinates that. Through your words, through your actions, through your gestures, through your thought processes, the way you think. You got to make sure that the truly, truly lesser does not come up with an impression that you landed like a star from the sky. If the truly lesser starts thinking of you like that, well, there are no frailties, there is no blood flowing in his veins right now. He's just a God in the flesh. You lied to the true lesser. And you're not going to grow in mercy at age of six level. You got to be very careful of that. You got to use relatable experiences to the people in your world that are bleeding from you. Let them see the frailties of your humanity to show them that if God Help me to overcome. This God can help you as well. There is nothing special about me. That's the reason I talked about all my frailties. I talked about my experiences. I give numerous opportunities and testimonies to see if God can do it for me. He can do it for you. Why am I doing that? I want to be honest for you. Because in that level of honesty toward a true lesson, you are going to be motivated. Wow. So these guys are not, they're not geniuses. They're, come on. So they can do it. I can do it too. Now in that mode of communicating like that too. Question. Will the truly lesser be motivated to fulfill their destiny? The answer of course is yes. But if I were to communicate to you that man. Come on now. You know me and my superstar. This, come on. This, 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 I don't need any God factor. I just came to this planet. I just know everything. What's the truly lesser going to be like? I just lie to them. 
I don't love them, and they're not going to move in their destiny. What, what's the, what's their attitude going to be like? Oh, woe is me, man. Oh, come on. I'm just out of luck because my name is this, and oh, come on. I'm, no, that's not going to be love. Remember, speak the truth in love in your relationships. So can you see that honesty in our relationships grows and goes beyond just telling somebody there's potatoes in the pantry right now that I took yesterday. It goes beyond that. That's a very shallow understanding of honesty. Honesty has to be in love. Honesty has to be what can I do to love you like God loves you even though you are my subordinate, even though you are my you are my peer, even though you are the true and greater. What can I do with my attitude to move you in the direction of your destiny? When you're thinking like that, your mercy caution is going to grow. When your mercy caution grows, you are going to see favorable circumstances that will position you to say zero treason, to sustain the status of zero treason, perfect obedience, the truth that God can love. Moving on to an anointing, immortality, and eligible for the next rapture. It's important. So this is H04, H05, H06, practical strategies that we identify right in this book. The overcomer secret is going to be really important. Make sure, make sure you get it. And of course, the details, the, the summary actually is actually stated on page 324. So if you have your copy of the overcomer secret, you're going to see all these things I'm talking about. What it means to be honest in our relationship. You're going to see on page 324, 325. You got the latest copy of the overcomer secret. It's going to be called the overcomer's chart. It's all there for you guys. Make sure you get it. But then, yet, yeah, there is another level of honesty which we identified in the book called the ultimate level of honesty, which will be H07. And the scripture that talks about that is going to be Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 35. Turn to it. Let's read the Bible a little bit, right? <laughs> Turn to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. It says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Well, so this is Yahushua talking over here. He says, my words will never pass away. He says, heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away. Well, this is the ultimate level of honesty over here. But how is this honesty? Well, I'm going to show you how this is honesty. Well, if somebody were to tell you that I'm going to go to the grocery store tomorrow, for example. Say, yeah. Or maybe let me say, now, I'm coming to your house tomorrow. I'm coming to your house tomorrow. Oh, yeah, they're going to come to my house. So I, you know what? I've, I've prepared a room for them. I've gotten the, the, the dinner, the meals ready. Everything's honky-dory. But all of a sudden, tomorrow comes, and they don't, they don't show up at your house. Oh, wow, I'm feeling so bad right now. Did they, were they honest to you, or did they lie to you? And the answer is going to be, of course, they lied to me. You said it was going to come to my house, and here's uh, tomorrow. You didn't come to my house. Come on, look at you. He's a liar. You lied to me. So being able to keep your words is going to be on a level of honesty. But here, after two days or three days, I called my friend. and said, hey, God, you know what? I'm sorry. I couldn't make it over to your house because it was snowing really badly outside. My car broke down and started giving a bunch of excuses to justify... <laughs> My inability to fulfill my word. But does that change the fact that I just lied? It doesn't change it. Even though the excuses may be justifiable. There was weather pressures on the outside. There's something out there on the outside. All these things happened. I couldn't make it. And my friend, of course, is going, yeah, I understand it was real bad. It was snowing. You couldn't make it. I understand. Don't worry. We're going to plan for it later. But it still doesn't change the fact that I lied. So telling a lie goes beyond intentions. Telling a lie includes you not having the ability to keep and watch over your words performing. And Yahushua says it's over there, that's never going to happen to my words. Whoa! So when God says, I'll never lie to you, the Father has good intentions of not lying to you. And secondly, the Father has the resources to watch over his word to perform it. And at your level of H07, you are like that as well. Oh, that's Jesus. I, I don't think I'm going to be like Jesus. Well, first, you call Yahushua Lord, 
You are a disciple of Jesus. You should be aspiring to be like Matthew 24, 35 over here. So Yahushua says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. You should be like that. Your words never pass away. You don't speak idle words anymore. You speak on purpose right now. That's H07. And you have God's power backing up your word to orchestrate circumstances to make sure that everything you say, you watch it over to perform it. Whoa. Can I be like that? Yes, you can. Because people who were born in ship and iniquity, just like you and me were born in ship and iniquity, they were like that on the side of eternity. An example was Elijah. Elijah gave a word that says, By my word, it's not going to be in rain during the time of Ahab and Jezebel back in the Old Testament. And by his word, no rain for three years. And then he came around and said, By my word, it's going to be rain right now. And then he unlocked the heavens. There was, there was rain over there in the Old Testament. No, but that was the Old Testament. Those guys were operating. I didn't know what they were drinking, eating the Old Testament. None of the app in the New Testament as well. What about Paul? Paul was telling the sailors uh, that they shouldn't sail. He told them, well, this voyage is going to be really, really disrupted, guys. Do not set sail. And they slapped him down, saying, you little preacher, you don't know what you're talking about. We're not going to listen to you. He says, well, well, guess what happened? They lost all their cargoes and they scarcely saved their lives. Paul's words came to pass just like he said. So we'll see people and numerous characters like that all through the Bible. They're going to say something's going to come to pass. Say something. Well, they are operating in 807. Now you got to be like that as well. <laughs> How will you be like that? Well, the way you are going to be like that is by speaking based on the complete counsel of the Lord. Your words are going to be predicated on the prophetic for the moment. You're not just going to be saying anything that comes out of the cold that blew into your ears. Oh, wow, this ear feels cool. Come on, I'm going to do something. For you. Don't, don't, don't be quick to say something right now. You're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. What can we do here to further the cause of righteousness? How is this going to be aligned in the direction of the prophetic for the moment? Prophetic for my life, prophetic for the earth, prophetic for this person over here. What's, you're going to speak based on a complete counsel of God. Because the Bible says, do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. The book of Proverbs. So if I were not to add to God's word, and God's not going to rebuke me and prove me to be a liar. So the, the very first way, first thing to do to practice 8 to 7, make sure you're not adding to God's word. So you get God on your side. Just like God was on Samuel's side. The word of God says concerning Samuel that God did not allow any of his word to fall to the ground. Everything Samuel said while he was leading Israel, he was a judge of Israel, for years and years, never fell, never fell to the ground. God watched over Samuel's words to fulfill. So I'm going to operate in 807, ultimate level of honesty, be him like my father. I'm going to make sure I get God on my side. On the side of my words. Father, what's your intention in this regard? That's exactly what I'm going to say. Now you say that. And then you generate spiritual land to enforce the kingdom of God in that story. So that there is not going to be rain or snow when you're trying to go to your neighbor's house. You generate a spiritual land for resources. So circumstances are conducive to make sure your words come to pass. That's how to... How to, to that's how to operate in 807. But there is not going to be any mercy to operate in 807 if I fail at 806, 805, 804. Or based on level of honesty. It's got to keep on growing on you guys. Growing on you. Baseline level of honesty. And honesty in my relationships. And then 807. So these are the major levels of honesty that God allowed us to identify. Reading that book, and of course, there may be additional levels of honesty which God will show you as you journey, journey on with the Lord. So there may be HO 4.2, HO 5.3, HO 6.2, or something like that in between that God may show you. But the principle is going to be the same and open your heart. So that is chapter 26, talking about levels of honesty so we can grow our mercy quotient. Hallelujah. The mercy of the Lord is going to be tempered in the demands of negative judgment, activated because of my sins, 
is going to neutralize the effect of my frailties and is going to work in circumstances to help me to sustain the status of obedience. How is that different from grace? I'm going to talk about it real quickly. I don't think I've talked about that this year. Well, the way you're going to know mercy is different from grace is look at the example of what happened between John the Beloved and Braggadocious Peter during the crucifixion of the Lord. So during the crucifixion, the crucifixion of the Lord, circumstances were organized to pressure Peter to deny his allegiance to, to Jesus. But circumstances were not organized to pressure John the Beloved to deny his allegiance to the Lord. So John sustained the status of perfect obedience. Peter did not sustain the status of perfect obedience. Was that grace on the part of John? No. If John were pressured like Peter was pressured, most likely would have failed. <laughs> he wasn't grace, he was mercy. Why? Because he was honest. And Peter was dishonest. At the Last Supper, oh, look at all of them. Oh, it's not uh, getting braggadocious and pompous. If all of them deny you, look, come on, oh, I'll never deny you. And that boast, that braggadocio, stripped him of mercy. This thing is real, guys. The system has been designed to work that way. You start getting braggadocious. You start boasting and feeling pompous about yourself and being dishonest, even though God's telling you, better shut up right now, Peter. You're not that strong to do this thing. Just keep quiet. No, you start getting pompous and arrogant. You go into circumstances. It's going to be working to prove that you're a liar. I've seen it all through the years. Wow. This is amazing study, man. So if I understand this is the way the system works, guess what? I'm not going to be braggadocious about anything anymore. I learned it years ago. I said, no way. I'm not going to be braggadocious. Return all the glory to God. Kick your mouth shut. Or you can get circumstance to prove you're a liar. Watch out for that. Well, that, so that's chapter 26, levels of honesty, so we can grow our mercy portion. Glory to God. And then chapter 27 right now. Chapter 27 is going to be talking about levels of humility. Which there are going to be humility levels one, two, three as well as baseline levels of humility. Humility level one is going to be equivalent to seeking after God in response to H O one. So after I acknowledge that there's a God somewhere, the natural corollary of that acknowledgement is going to be start seeking for that God. Now the action of wanting to seek after God is humility. That's the technical difference. H01 is going to acknowledge the existence of God, correct? And some people acknowledge the existence. I know God, God's around. I know there's a God somewhere. What are you doing without knowledge? Nothing. Well, what are you doing when you know there's a God around? And are you seeking after that God? Well, I didn't have time. I'm too busy. Well, that's pride. You know, there's somebody who gives you breath every morning, but that person is not worthy of your attention. Or your search. Well, that's a baseline level of pride. <laughs> so that's how we know HU1 is going to be seeking after God. HU2 is going to be refusing to be offended at God. If I acknowledge the folly of my ways, then I'm not going to be offended at God or offended at the preacher or the word of God. They'll go punch the preacher in the nose and say, Well, come on, I dare you read that, read that scripture to me like that. No, you should not have read that scripture to me. I'm going to punch you in the nose. No, I'm not going to do that. If I got HU2, glory to God. And HU3 is going to be casting my cares on the Lord because I understand that I have acknowledged that God is the source of my prosperity. All these things are going to be stated in overcomers chart, which are going to be um, which is going to be on pages 324 and 325 of the Overcomer Secret. On page number 20 of uh, discipleship study known by the grace of God. Then these baseline levels of humility, HU1, 2, 3, will pre create a platform for humility in our relationships as well. There is going to be HU4, which is going to be now deference or submission to the truly greater. HU5 is going to be selflessness to our peers. HU6 is going to be patience and gentleness to our truly lesser. And HU7 is going to be submitted to the whole counsel of God, which was revealed when you spoke based on a complete understanding of God's whole counsel. 
So we know right now that we got to be humble. We got to be honest in our relationships. But the end, you know, honesty should lead to humility. So how do we know that? How do we practice humility in our relationships? Let's delve deep right now. Turn back to 1 Peter 5, 5 real quick. 1 Peter 5, 5 says in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. And all of you be clothed in humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace or favors to the humble. Now, can you see over there that God acknowledges different relationships? It says there is the younger and there is the older, or there is the younger and there is the elder. And the way the younger person is going to practice humility to where the elder person, to where the older person, is going to submit to the older person. But then this verse of scripture did not tell us how the older person is going to practice humility to where the younger person. Oh, but I thought the older person says that all of you be clothed in humility, correct? But what type of humility is the elder going to exhibit toward the older person? Isn't that submission as well? No. But it's humility, correct? There are different levels of humility. Yahushua was humble. But did Yahushua submit to his disciples? No. He didn't submit to them. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, I'm going to break it down for you. So we've seen relationships all through the Bible and in the Bible where God actually expects people to submit to the older. But he's not going to be asking the older to submit to the younger. Now, we've seen, no, no, let me take that back. Now, we've seen, the scripture says, younger, submit yourself to your elders, right? But we've seen situations in which God actually elevated a younger person and then asked the elder or the older person to submit to the younger person. How do we know that? Well, we'll see that in the case of Moses. Aaron and Miriam, Moses was the youngest of the three, and God asked Miriam and Aaron to submit to Moses. And when they refused to submit to Moses, God spanked them really badly. We see the case between Aaron and Cain, uh, well, um, between Cain and Abel, pardon me, between Cain and Abel. We see that situation between Cain and Abel. What happened to, 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 to Cain? Well, Cain disregarded the sacrifice that he brought to the Lord and God elevated Abel, expected Cain, the older person, to submit to Abel to learn something from him. We've seen the situation with David and his brothers, Joseph and his brothers, Jacob and Esau. We've seen all these situations in the Bible. So as far as God, God is concerned, what he is really looking for is not necessarily age elder, but true greatness elder. So that's the reason we're writing this book. We're not necessarily calling it younger, submit to elder. We're talking about truly lesser, submitted to the truly greater. Now, how do we call out that word? Well, we came up with that word because of Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 7, the word of God talks about the concept of truly greater and truly lesser. Look at it. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So I didn't come up with that word. Hebrews 7 someone came up with it. And if you read that passage very well, you are going to see that it is written in the context of how Abraham deferred or gave tithes to Melchizedek, who had a resource on him to bless Abraham. And then Melchizedek went ahead and he blessed Abraham, even though Melchizedek didn't have money to give Abraham. And that scripture tells us that Melchizedek was the truly greater and Abraham was the truly lesser. Now that's the plan of God all the while when he was inspiring Peter to document 1 Peter 5.5. 5. But Peter, because of the baggage of traditions, the Holy Spirit is telling him, well, what I'm really talking about is the truly lesser to defer to the truly greater. Uh, and the back of his mind is going to interpret that Younger, submit to the elder, and all of you be clothed in humility toward one another. That's the way they're going to interpret that. But look at it, all through the Bible. So that's the reason it's important to let the Holy Spirit guide you to understand and see the spirit behind the letter. Don't just take the letter and run off with it. And lots and lots of cultures are guilty of that. They take the letter of the Bible, they run off with it. 
So the older person is, <laughs> is just goofing up. There is no anointing. There's no resource in their lives. And they are too pompous and arrogant to listen to anybody else just because they're younger than them. That's not God. God's, you're going to start behaving like Lucifer because of that. It's one of the challenges of Lucifer. Lucifer was demoted. And he was told to report to humanity, Adam and Eve. And he felt jealous of that. He said, come on, look at these young creatures of God that God just made a few, a few years ago. And he became pompous and jealous because he fell into disfavor with God. So make sure you're not like that. Age is not important. True greatness is what the Father was looking for. Now what is true greatness to start with? True greatness is a resource. What makes you truly greater is a resource which we call the anointing upon which God places on you because of a long-term exercise of obedience to God for the people in your world and to move you in a direction of immortality. And that's true greatness. That's what's going to make you truly greater. It's not because... Now, ordinarily... If you're older, the fact that you've been in this planet for a longer period of time should position you for true greatness. But unfortunately, that's not the case with humanity. You can see people, they just flip flopping into disobedience, left, right, and center. Will God make them true? Of course not. But then here's this younger person. Everything God tells him to do, is doing it. Of course, God's going to place a resource on that person and expect the truly greater to come learn of the ways of the true lesson. And in that mode, that's submission. Now, what is submission? And that word is treated with contempt in this generation. Submission. Submission. I'm not going to submit to you, especially in relationships and in homes. You're going to say, no, I'm not going to be submitting. No, God damn, I'm not. If you don't submit to me, I'm not going to submit. <laughs> and I think years ago, somebody wrote a book called uh, The Grace of Mutual Submission. Now, what you matter to say is the, is the chaos of mutual submission. There is grace in mutual humility, but not necessarily in mutual submission. What is submission? Now, the dictionary is going to define submission as simply being under the power and the authority of somebody. Full stop. But that's not the God kind of submission. Submission is best described in the relationship that occurred between Yahushua, Jesus Christ, and the disciples. Because simply being under the power and the authority of somebody does not necessarily mean that you're submitted to them. I'm going to uh, cite this example for you. So compare the relationship between Jesus and his disciples and the relationship between Daniel, Shadrach, Mission of Abigail, and Nebuchadnezzar back in Babylon. So if submission is going to be simply defined as simply being under the authority of somebody, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were under the authority of Nebuchadnezzar, but in the back of their hearts, they pray, oh God, please deliver us from here. Deliver us from Nebuchadnezzar. Come on, we got to go back to and come deliver us. Will you consider that submission? Will God consider that a submission? Of course not. But now contrast that relationship to the disciples and Jesus. The disciples were under the authority of the master. Yeah, correct. But in the back of their hearts, they're like, well, this is the greatest thing that could have happened to me. And I'm not thinking of going out with them. No. When Jesus told them that he had to leave and go, they were completely devastated. Disciples didn't want to leave Yahushua. Anything Yahushua told them to do out of love for the master, they're going to go ahead and do. Oh, uh, Peter, give me your boats over there. Oh, come on, master. Yeah, here's my boats. Go over here. They're going to do everything. Hey, you guys go ahead and get that donkey for me because I've got a ride on it. It's Okay, here we're going to go get that donkey. Hey, you guys, they're doing everything out of love. Now, in the eyes of the Father, which one is going to be submission? If you know your Bible very well, with a little bit of study right there, you're going to know that the relationship between Jesus and the disciples, and actually between the disciples and the Lord, is submission. God kind of submission. The relationship between Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Mishnah, and Abednego is not submission. So submission goes beyond just trying to be under the authority or the control of somebody. What is submission? Submission is exactly what Jesus defines as submission in Matthew 11. Look at Matthew chapter 11. 
This is Jesus talking to his disciples over here. It's an invitation to want to learn from the ways of the truly greater so that you can have rest for your soul. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That is submission. The invitation that Jesus gives his disciples over here is to come and learn from my way. Come learn from my strategy, you guys, so that you can have rest for your souls. So at the back of the line of Peter, James and John, the rest of the disciples, they are coming to learn from the ways of the master so they can find rest for their souls. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not interested in learning from the ways of Nebuchadnezzar even though they were under the control of Nebuchadnezzar. That's the submission. So the intents of the father in HU4 relationship from the true and lesser, the true and greater is for the true and lesser to have an attitude of wanting to learn from the ways of the true and greater. If you have that attitude to run the true and greater, man, I want to just pull on this auction. I want to learn from this. I want to learn from their ways over there. That's the way you think. That's the way you speak to them. That's the way that you gesture. That's your conversation with them. You have HU4 and you are going to be open to greater grace because of that. You don't have that attitude, your grace portion is not going to grow. And guess what? You cannot sustain the status of perfect obedience just like that. You're going to be straining against the Lord. It's going to be difficult to please God in that mode because the resource on the true and greater that God placed on them, not solely for the true and greater, but because of you, you're not getting because of that arrogance in your heart. You've got to fix it. Oh, yeah. But the business community is telling you to be independent. They're teaching you to do this and do this. No, 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 no. They are the seeds of Lucifer. That's the reason they're streaming down to hell. Nothing is going to work in that mode. The infrastructure of Babylon is going to get them. The spirit of disobedience in the air is going to get all kinds of things are going to happen on the outside to the carnal and the unbelieving and they can't because the law is in motion. This is, these things are laws right now. So HU4 is going to work when you are truly submitted to the true and greater. Now, who is the true and greater? The true and greater is going to be the person who has the resource on there to push you in the direction of your destiny. So that means i got to identify the true and greater. How do I identify the true and greater? Oh, they got to have more money than me? Not necessarily. They're going to have more education than me? Not necessarily. Look at the scripture in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, it says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. What I am calling the submission going forward right now is going to be imitating the faith of the true and greater. But the Bible didn't say for you to imitate the faith of the true and greater. Firstly, it says you've got to consider the outcome of their lives, which is where H04 comes to place. So look at the outcome of their lives. Oh, but I don't know them. I don't know what's going on in their homes. But you are that outcome of their lives. When you relate with the true and greater, what are certain things that happen to you that push you in the direction of righteousness or demote your ability to please the Father in relating with them? If you are that outcome, check the impacts that they have on your life. If the impact is positive, they are the true and greater. You are that outcome. Now, you reserve the right to imitate their faith. You reserve the right to think like they're the true and greater. You reserve the right to show them deference. And all the word for submission is going to be deference. So you reserve the right to do that. And that's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not a bad thing if you're driving the car. Somebody is going to be driving the car. And they're moving you closer and closer to your destination. And you're a passenger. There's no point trying to yank the steering away from their hands and say, come on, and why are you trying to drive me over there? Nah, well, no, let them drive. He's the one in the driver's seat. She is the driver. He is the driver. Identify the true and greater based on Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, and then imitate their faith. If I do that, 
I do that, then I am going to have more grace to help me move in the direction of my destiny. Oh, yeah, but they're not doing this and then, and come on, oh, oh, how do they show you? No, 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 just let's fix this one first. The truly greater is going to be required to practice H U six as well. Oh, but they're not a truly greater. Okay, even if they're not a truly greater, then what should be your attitude? Your attitude should be H U six. It is still humility. Now, what kind of humility are you going to practice if they are not a truly greater? In they are not a truly greater, the kind of humility that you're going to practice toward them uh, is going to be captured in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2. Let's see this type of humility. These are practical strategies to train your thought process to, to be humble. Look at Ephesians 4 2 right now. Be completely humble and gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love. In other words, when I am gentle and patient, I am still humble. Not submission this time. So the way for the truly greater or the older person, if he's doing things right, to be humble toward the truly lesser or the younger person is to be gentle and patient. And Jesus epitomizes that to his disciples as well. Yahushua wouldn't defer to his disciples, but he was patient and gentle toward them. He was gentle toward Braggadocious Peter. He was gentle and patient even with Judas. Judas was stealing from the offering for three years. And Yahushua knew about it. And Yahushua carried a resource on him that could have burned Judas' finger when he tried to talk that offering basket. So you, next time you try to talk that offering basket, that I'm going Get your finger smart. You can burn your finger. Cut it off a little bit for you. Teach you a lesson over there. Jesus could have done that. And all he needed to do was to speak one word. He says, Judas, next time you talk that offering basket, I want your middle finger cut off. So you're going to don't, don't steal from the offering animal. But he didn't do that. That's patience. That is gentleness. But that's not submission. But that is humility. In the case of John and James, they were <laughs> throwing tantrums, John and James, sons of thunder. He could have dealt with them with the anointing carried. But Jesus was patient and gentle. That is still humility. But Yahushua did not submit to learn of their ways. You see the difference right now. There are different levels of humility. But how come we can't see this? Well, I'm seeing this not because I'm any better than my fathers in the faith. I'm seeing this because I live in a more privileged dispensation with regards to God's end time plan. And I don't have locks of traditions in the back of my heart and crying to God, not from the tents of traditions, but outside the tents of traditions, and God opened my eyes to see his expectations with regards to humility, to let me know that there are different relationships to start with and there are going to be different levels of humility. So humility level four is going to be submitted to the truly greater, wanting to learn of their ways, deferring to them. And if you fix your heart on this, wanting to learn of truly greater, pulling on their, on their incense and all of that, you are going to have more grace. It's going to work between the husband and the wife. So all you women out there writing books about the grace of mutual submission, or what you meant to say is the, is the chaos of mutual submission. It's nothing like that. Firstly, you got to redefine what submission is to you. Submission is not being on the authority of somebody. Submission is wanting to learn from the ways of the truly greater so you can find rest for your soul. Now, but doesn't Ephesians chapter 5 talk about submitting to one another? Let's turn to it. And I'm going to tell you that that scripture that you're writing a book based on should have been translated and practiced true humility toward one another. Look at it. Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 21. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Correct. But don't stop reading. Wives, submit yourself to your husband as to the Lord. For, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body, in which is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives you submit to their husbands and everything. And husbands love your wives. Stop a little bit. How come this verse of scripture didn't say husband submits your wives? Look at that. But I thought you should submit to one another. I mean, no, 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 no. 
That word submission in verse 21 should have been translated practice true humility toward one another out of reverence for Christ. How do you know that? But the letter doesn't say that I don't care about what the letter says. I'm going to read the spirit behind it. What's the spirit behind it? The spirit behind it is to mimic the relationship that exists between the church and Jesus and try to port that relationship over to a husband and a wife. That's how you're going to get the spirit behind it. You're going to ask yourself, how does Jesus treat the church? Does Yahushua submit to the church? No, he doesn't. But does Yahushua love the church? Yes, he does. Is that humility correct? What kind of love is that? It is a patience, gentleness kind of love. So much so that Yahushua is going to give his life for the church. Now, husbands are going to be like that. When it comes to you and that woman over there, you got to make sure you let her know that you're willing to give your life for her. Oh, wow. In that mode, if she doesn't submit to you, God's going to spank her. But if you're, you're selfish and you're going to say, well, you're not modeling after Jesus. What about dysfunctional husbands? I know. <laughs> they're, not, they're not interested in being like Jesus. The wife is the one doing all the praying, doing all the things for the family. But the husband is just acting recklessly like an idiot. What's God going to do? God's going to deal with that. Go, go talk to him. Go look at a story of a neighbor like Abigail back in the Old Testament. God's going to demote you. You gotta get serious right now, somebody. So you don't worry about that woman. What you're gonna do in that mode is first Peter chapter three. You are still gonna be practicing patience and gentleness. No longer deference right now with regards to learning of his reckless ways, because it's true greatness. In that mode, the wife is truly greater. Yeah, in that mode. But your prayer is going to be for your husband to ascend to the office of true greatness so that you can fulfill your destiny as a family together. But in that moment, you're not going to be saying, well, come on, look at me. I'm the one doing all this. You're rebellious already. You don't do that. You stay in patience, which is HU6, and gentleness. Praying for your man to ascend to his role of leadership so that he can fulfill his, because it's an office thing, guys. you got to understand. So that husband relationship is an office thing that God has positioned over there for your woman to fulfill your destiny. The man is not in his office just yet. He's stepping out of his office. You keep on praying to God and patient for him to ascend to his place and position of that husband role. And then going forward, when he ascends over there, you pull the unction out of him. Beautiful, beautiful sister. That's the way it's going to work. But in an ideal situation in which the husband is, is really the true greater over there, you have no... Reasons for concern to want to learn from the true agreement. Pull that unction out of him so you can reach your destiny. That is HU4, HU6. I talked about that together because they go together. Now my question to you is, if you want to defer or submit to the true agreement, will you create an impression in the mind of the true agreement that I don't need you? The answer, of course, is going to be no. What kind of impression are you going to create if you want to defer to the true greater? Then I need you. Well, that's how we go, H04. Because I talked about it, I'm going to get, get back to it in chapter 27. That if you want to be patient and gentle to a true greater, true lesser, which is H06, will you create an impression in the mind of the true, true lesser that you're just an idiot, you can't get it, you're going to be stuck in here forever? No, you're not going to create that impression, right? Which impression are you going to create? I'll be through your, through your shoes. I'm vulnerable to, to the same challenges that you're going through. Well, that's going to be H06. That's how we got it. What about HU5? Now, let's do, look at HU5. Now, humility toward my peers is going to be defined in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 3. Look at it. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. And this verse of scripture was written within the context of what Yahushua had to do for, for the Father. So I'm going to go over there and save those guys. The Bible says, being equal with God, he did not count equality as something to be grasped. But rather, he let it go and came in the form of a servant. Well, God calls that humility as well. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. In humanly value others. So when I start to value other people's interests, especially my peers right now, 
Well, it's not me first, it's you first. You go for it. I'm not necessarily trying to learn of your ways. I'm not necessarily trying to imitate your strategy. But I just want to prefer that you do this first because of you. Well, that's humility at HU5. And that attitude over there is going to keep me open to the grace of God. Hallelujah. Now, if I want to be like that, I want to be selfish. I want to be selfless <laughs> toward my peers. Will I create an impression among my peers that I'm not interested in what you got to do? No, of course not. What kind of impression will I create in the mind of my peers? Well, I'll let them know that interest in your concerns. It's you first. Go for it. Well, that's H U five. So H U four, H O four, H U five, H H O five, H U six, H O. Everything is written on pages three twenty four, three twenty five. We call it the Overcomers Chart by the Wisdom. But then there is the ultimate level of humility. Which the ultimate level of humility will be submitted to the whole counsel of God. Based on Psalm 138 in verse 2. It says, you have might magnified your word above your name. So it's God's character. His name is actually submitted to the written counsel. So we talked about how to identify the whole counsel of God in chapter 26 and 807. And that whole counsel, when I incline my heart and submit to that whole counsel... That's going to be each you seven by the grace of God. So please and please take advantage of, of all of this. It's going to be up on, on pages 324 and 325, the overcomers chart. You're all going to see all the different levels of humility over there. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then chapter 28 starts talking about the level of faith. When I practice HOs and HUs in my relationships, God is going to reward that attitude with a greater degree of understanding. Why? Because the meek is going to be taught the ways of the Lord. Which scripture says that Psalm 25 and verse 9 says, The meek will be taught the ways of the Lord. And in that mode, the deeper my understanding gets, the greater my faith is going to be. Why? Because understanding is going to attach patience to your faith. The word God says that a man of great patience is a man of deep understanding. In the book of Proverbs. You want to have great faith? The faith that can stand firmly forever for 4,000 years like the Father's faith. The God kind of faith. You need a lot of patience, which is going to be because of a lot of understanding. Which is going to be because of growing honesty and humility. You couple all that together, your faith's going to grow in lips and bounds by the grace of God. And you will be exactly like your Father. The word of God says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. This is a time, saying to God, to seek the face of God in honesty and humility. So God can keep on sending healing to your circumstances, healing to your body, especially in a season like this, season of chaos. We call it seal form. What's going to keep you shielded from the impact of the pale horse rider is to grow in honesty, in humility, and faith. Your attitudes, your way of thinking, in your relationships. Be honest over there. Be humble in your relationships. Out of love is going to make you open and stay open to the grace and the mercy of God. And with the grace and the mercy of God, there is no mountain that you will not level. Say to God in the name of Yahushua. Amen. So that's the end of the Overcomer Secret. There are additional things, um, appendices, quick helps, like uh, little articles that you can read over there. Uh, you're going to see answers to the quiz times uh, uh, section. You are going to see uh, the blogs real terms and all of those. So that please and please take advantage of it. The book is available on the website. I believe maybe may be ordered from our website, um, heroesmart.com slash store or from Amazon or study notes. You know, there's lots of lots of ways you can actually handle all of these things by the grace of God. All right. You can get something from it. Saints of God. I believe you did. All right. So as my custom is, I would like to give the viewing audience an opportunity to make the Lord, Yahushua, the Lord of their lives. For those who may not have done that before. Um, I'm going to read to you the most complete salvation scripture I can find in my Bible. And it's going to be Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21.
says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. So this verse of scripture lets us know what it takes to make over to the kingdom of heaven. Call him Lord, Lord, Yahushua, Je Jesus, Jesus, whatever you want to come along, Lord, Lord, and then leave it to please the Father. If you like to make that decision, it will be a great honor and a great privilege for me, for you to allow me to help you and do that. So if you like to do that, please say this prayer right after me. Say, Yahushua, I realize that I've been a sinner. Living by my wits and powers, calling myself Lord, and refusing to call you Lord. I repent of that, and I ask you, please forgive me. I call you Lord, Master, Boss, and Savior. Please save me from my sins. Give me a new heart to receive the resources to please my Father. And I want to thank you for hearing me today. I believe you died and you were resurrected to save me from my sins. I call you Lord and I am born again. Recreated in the image of my Father. With your grace and mercy, I will please the Father and be on my way to heaven. In the name of Yahushua. Amen. Amen, amen. Glory to God. Congratulations if you pray that prayer with me. You are born again. Welcome to the family of God. It's an honor to have you as a brother. It's an honor to have you as a sister. Congratulations. Welcome to God's family. Now, if you pray that prayer with me, please let us know about it. You're going to send us an email at inquiry at herosmart.com and I am going to send you additional resources free of charge so you can grow your faith and come on board with the rest of us. But there are lots of things to learn, right? This is a new life right now. If any man is in Christ, is a new creation. Old things have passed away, right? But you're going to learn. Just like a little baby asked for it. You're going to learn a lot of things over there. So let us know about it. Inquiry at HeroSmart.com and we will send those resources to you free, free of charge. Congratulations once again, my brother and my sister, for making this quantum decision to follow on with the only leader, the leader, Yahushua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, the Savior. Hallelujah. Welcome to God's family. All right. Um, for the rest of our families and friends, we may want to take a copy of the study notes to the board. I'm going to step away from the screen for just a little bit and give you plenty of opportunity and time to do that. So you're welcome to pause your device and take a copy of the study notes to the board. And I'll be back right after 10 seconds. got a chance to take a copy of the study notes on the board. I want to thank you for staying on board. This is the Overcomer Secret Part 5, 2021 Pharmacist Section, 2022 Pharmacist Section of the ODP. And I want to thank you for staying on board. We're not done with the ODP, just if we can move straight into the milk section of the word to study fun things about the Christian discipleship program that we put together by the grace of God. So make sure you come back. We're going to do a whole lot of good by the grace of God. Until then, remember God cares about you and so do we. Yahushua is Lord. 